Thank you, Natalie. Natalie Chandon is speaking today. She came to us from the US, but you have multiple nationalities. And I'll explain her name. You came here, you contacted us six years ago and, and spent a lot of time with us here in Davos, which we enjoyed very much. Uh, you, you were very active in um, discussing science here in our group. You were one of the persons starting our statistics support group, which we still continue. That, that was very nice to have you here all the time. When you contacted us, you started to work in Boulder, Colorado for your PhD, working with a, a beautiful plant, Selena Akaulis, the moss campion, and we worked that, with that as well. So that was the reason why for a lot of field work, you came here for several seasons. You traveled back and forth, but you spent a lot of time here with us in Switzerland, working on that plant. Before that, you did your bachelor thesis in Berkeley, California, and then continued with your PhD thesis in Boulder, Colorado with Dan Doak, who some people might be familiar with. Then when you defended that thesis, you still continued work here on your postdoc together with Sonia Vip and Sina Norman and Aarhus. And after this, so soon you will leave for British Columbia, UBC, for a postdoc with Amy Angert. So we're very sad to lose you here, but we're also happy that you go to such a wonderful place and continue your science there. In your work, you, you did extensive field work with the moss campion, but also with other plants. We'll hear about that. And then recently you advanced a lot on spatial modeling, which is you will also what you will also talk about today. Your talk today will be about improving spatial models for ecological predictions. After the talk, when you have questions, audience, please just raise your hand electronically. Then I can wear a lot of people here and I can see who has a question. And with that, Natalie, the floor is yours and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that very, very warm introduction. And I appreciate everyone coming here today. It's quite an honor to have such an audience. Uh, can I just get a quick confirmation that I'm sharing my screen? Yes, thank you. So ecological spatial models, as many of you know, are incredibly powerful tools. They're widely used and they're really, really important for climate change predictions. In fact, we rely on them more and more. And that means that we need to better understand how well they do, as well as what their limitations are. This is something that I'm particularly interested in, especially understand what drives population persistence at a local level and how to incorporate this kind of information to potentially improve these kinds of predictive models. In this talk today, I'll explore some of the modeling limitations with these and hope to leave you with some potential solutions. I'll specifically focus on a class of models that are most widely used, namely species distribution models or SDMs and species abundance models or SAMs. And these predict distribution or abundance now or potentially even in the future if we want them to. It's in fact quite straightforward how they work on a basic level, but there are many nuances that make some main assumptions not met in a lot of practice. So today I'll first very briefly introduce how they work, and then I'll talk about two main problems, focusing on two separate studies. I'll first talk about how to incorporate potential intraspecific differences for example, local adaptation to different climates in different parts of a species range into SDMs. And then I'll talk about how to better match models to biological processes, specifically using high resolution models to model distribution and abundance, and then validating those models with new observational data. As Christian said, and you'll see throughout this talk, I combine extensive field surveys with modeling tools, and I specifically focus on the distribution and abundance of vascular plants and alpine to Arctic regions. 
The question of what determines species distributions has been a central theme in ecology for hundreds of years. And many naturalists and ecologists, some who we know better than others, try to understand what causes patterns in species distributions. Given that species distributions have been so central a topic for so long, it's really surprising that we still don't know exactly what causes them. However, we do know that they're broadly driven by abiotic and biotic factors. Some of those include topography, climate, substrate, interspecific interactions, pollination and herbivory. So to quickly visualize a species distribution, if we imagine a species is found in certain parts of the Northern Hemisphere, the species would be able to grow, survive, and reproduce in all of the green areas shown on the map and not in any of the gray areas. So that makes the edge of the gray and the green the species distributional limit. And this can occur along longitudinal, latitudinal, and elevational gradients. So this is central to biodiversity research because we need to understand the drivers of distribution limits so that we can actually predict these shifts. And this is because virtually all prediction of distribution shifts are based on the assumptions of what causes these limits. This is critical to mitigate biodiversity loss with climate change, which can result for, when example, invasive species outcompete native ones, asynchronous rain shifts, disrupt biotic interactions, or species even go extinct because they're not able to shift their ranges. So how are distributions and distribution shifts actually computationally described? The most common approach is to define a species climatic niche to construct correlative SDMs or SAMs. In fact, there are tens of thousands of studies using especially the SDM approach with new ones published almost every single day. So these models take data on a species known geographic locations and possibly abundances and correlate these data with the climate in those places to determine the species climatic niche. There are many different aspects of climate within a species range. For example, one part of the range, we can have high precipitation and low temperatures. On the other part of the range, we can have high temperatures and low precipitation. And the model correlates these data, uh, and the model correlates those data with the um, known distribution or abundance in each of these locations to then predict or project potential distribution or abundance now or in future climates within landscapes of interest. So this brings me to the first problem that I'll discuss today, namely the rarely tested assumption that all populations respond equally to climate. This means that when we construct one of these models with the species full geographic range, the model will assume that the climate niche for the whole species range is also that for individual populations. However, we know that many plants and animals show interspecific differences. And so we'd actually expect different populations to respond differently to climate change. For example, this pink flower species might have these four different distinct population groups, if you will. In each of these groups, because it experiences different climate, might be adapted to different climatic conditions. And so once these conditions change, we would expect these responses to be different across the species range. However, this would not be reflected in model predictions, meaning that we'd under or overestimate populations' ability to respond to climate change, thus biasing predictions of shifts. One way to address this is to construct intraspecific level SDMs to account for potential local adaptation in regional climatic niches. We could then merge those composite predictions for a global prediction, reflecting a traditional SDM output. This would mean that predictions are tailored to local response. So again, using the example of this pink flower species, we could construct composite predictions for each of these different groups and then each of those would be tailored to these different climatic conditions. 
But if these kinds of composite predictions actually perform better than SDMs constructed with the species full range is rarely compared, even though we'd expect these to perform better since so many populations and or species, I should say, show intraspecific variation. I recently worked with Daniel Doak, Megan Peterson, and Samuel Pironon to examine if intraspecific level SDMs might be a useful approach. We used 4,000 global occurrences for Silenia collis from colleagues as field studies, as well as filtered global occurrence records. Silenia collis is a low growing alpine and arctic cushion plant and it's common in wide distribution across the Northern Hemisphere as seen in the map here, makes it a really ideal species for this work. There are likely many more occurrences and are shown here for especially Russia, but unfortunately there's not very much data for this region. So with these occurrences, we first constructed a baseline species level SDM, and we used the four climatic variables shown to be most important for the species. Namely, we use the one kilometer Chelsea climate data of annual temperature maximum and seasonality, as well as precipitation of the wettest month and seasonality, where seasonality is just the difference between the minimum and the maximum values of each year. For these models, we use the maximum entropy or maxlin algorithm because it's particularly good for presence only data. We then constructed individual intraspecific level SDMs for genetic or habitat groups to account for potential differences in local population response to climate. We define these groups as large subdivisions of the species range based on broad habitat or genetic differences. We define the genetic groups based on AFLP marker analysis done by Kusarova and her colleagues in 2015. And for each of these four different groups constructed one SDM. We define the six different habitat groups using the biome classifications from ecoregions. And then for each of these six different groups, again, constructed individual SDMs. And these habitat groups represent broad climatic differences, for example, between the tundra and the taiga. Of course, genetic and habitat differences are continuous, but we needed a definitive split to define these different groups. We then merge these intraspecific level SDMs for global predictions. These then resemble a traditional species level SDM or an SDM constructed with occurrences from the species full distribution. For example, we merge these four different genetic intraspecific level SDMs to, 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 to um, have a global map. In the next few slides, I'll only talk about the results from the genetic intraspecific level SDM because the results from the habitat one are very similar. To compare the global and intraspecific level genetic SDM outputs, we first needed to binarize the continuous SDM output of probability of occurrence. We did this by using a maximum sensitivity and specificity threshold, which just maximizes the sum of sensitivity and specificity. So this binary output then allowed us to quantify how much of the current known distribution is correctly identified by either of these SDM types. So again, we'd expected that there's a higher performance of the intraspecific level SDM. And in fact, that's what we found. We found that the genetic SDM outperforms the species level SDM. And we can see this with almost double the true skill statistic in the lower panel. The true skill statistic is one of several different model performance measures we can use of SDMs. And for this one specifically, a value of one would be a perfect model and zero would be a very bad model. So to visualize this result, these maps in green show what we considered the species known distribution taken from a Holton and Freeze botanical atlas map. And then in both of these panels, the pink is the overlap with the correctly pr predicted presences from either model. And if you focus especially on the lower panel, you can see that with a greater pinker area, there's greater overlap with the species known distribution 
therefore making this the better model. So again, this result itself is not surprising, but what is surprising is that so many SDMs are constructed with a species global distribution. Since the genetic and the species level SDMs give different predictions, it's therefore also not surprising that they predict different climate niches. In these plots, I'm plotting the two most important climate variables in these SDMs with temperature seasonality on the y-axis and maximum temperature on the x-axis. Again, temperature seasonality is just the difference between maximum and minimum values of every year. And here, I'm showing the climate data within one kilometer cells for predicted presences by either the species level SDM in green or the genetic SDM in gray. And I'm showing just two out of the four climate, uh, genetic groups. So if we focus on the plot on the left, we can see that in this region, the species level SDM in green over predicts the climate niche. Whereas if we focus on the region on the right, we can see that the species level SDM in green under predicts the niche. And this just really illustrates the unpredictability of how intraspecific level versus species level predictions might differ. So why do intraspecific level SDMs actually perform better? Most of us will assume that individual populations are actually locally adapted to climate. However, two of the other major reasons could be that there's a good amount of sampling bias in the occurrences records, or that there are actually different climates between each of these groups. If the climatic conditions in different parts of the range are indeed very different, then there'd be different constraints to species limits. This, however, would get lost in a species level SDM and therefore it would perform worse in the intraspecific left SDM, which could pick up on these different constraints. We explored the climate, climatic differences and the predicted occurrences between both the genetic and the habitat groups and concluded that SDM differences are not due to climatic differences between intraspecific groups. If the climatic space between the individual groups were, to, if that were to be the case, then we would see a spatial separation in each of these color cloud points, which represent different groups. Again here, I'm showing the climate data within one kilometer cells predicted as presence for each of the genetic on the left or habitat on the right groups. And we can see with a good amount of overlap between the groups that the climate is not identical, but it is similar and there's some overlap. And this simply means that climatic differences alone cannot fully explain that the intraspecific level SDMs are so much better. I'll briefly touch on another aspect of this work, which is the relationship between SDM output and species traits. Even though SDM output only formally predicts probability of occurrence, this output is often linked to measures of species performance or even ecological function. This is highly controversial with many studies supporting this and others contradicting it. So since our intraspecific level SDMs perform so much better, we were also curious if they might be able to infer species traits. We were able to test this using the data from global demographic and species interaction studies on the species, which gave us data on species performance as well as ecological function. So we had data on Silenia collis area, which is just the elliptical area of the cushion plant. And this is a good proxy of population performance because bigger plants will grow faster, survive better, or even both. And then we also had data on beneficiary percent cover which is just the percent cover of species growing inside the Silenia collis cushion. And this is a really important aspect of Silenia collis ecological function, as it's either a facilitator or a competitor to the species growing inside it. However, we found that none of the SDM predictions are correlated with species traits, as seen with a lack of patterns in these two plots. On the left, I'm plotting Silene cushion area on the y-axis and probability of occurrence on the x-axis, with each of the different colors representing a different SDM. And we can see there's just simply no pattern. 
On the right-hand plot, I have beneficiary species covered on the y-axis with the different colors representing different SCMs. And again, we just don't see a pattern. So as a solution to incorporating potential interspecific differences into SDMs, I encourage us to start using more composite SDMs to account for interspecific differences, but to still experimentally test species response to climate in different parts of the range. We ultimately need to understand species response to climate at a local level to inform how to split the species range into groups for composite predictions. This is because there's, of course, a trade-off between breaking up an existing large global data set into tiny little areas with very few data versus into large areas that are no longer biologically meaningful. And so this means that we really need to understand what kind of grouping makes sense. This brings me to part A of the problem of matching models to biological processes mainly that many of these kinds of spatial models are constructed at ecologically unmeaningful spatial scales. So this ignores what happens at very local scales. And I'm talking about scales even smaller than what I talked about previously. Because the majority of such models are constructed at about a one kilometer scale. That means there's a spatial mismatch between the scale of predictions and the spatial scale at which a species experiences its climate which can be anywhere from one centimeter to maybe five meters for larger woody species. However, we often don't model at this scale because we're simply not able to. We either can't get data at this kind of resolution or we don't have the computing power to do so. So to visualize this, if we can imagine that these three different colored circles represent different microclimates that also correspond to different vegetation structure in the landscape, this would not be captured by a one kilometer model that I'm broadly illustrating with the, with the white rectangle, because we would just get the mean value over this grid. This is of course much less of a problem when we're making broad global predictions such as greening across the Northern hemisphere, but it does become an issue when we're predicting species range shifts and extinctions at local scales. This is especially problematic for heterogeneous landscapes that are experiencing high rates of warming, such as the Arctic. And to give you an idea how heterogeneous the Arctic can be, take a look at these different ridges and gullies from drone footage from Jeff Kirby. So if we're not capturing species response in heterogeneous landscapes, then it makes it really difficult to use these models to distinguish between drivers of distribution versus abundance. And this becomes especially important in the Arctic where we don't have a good understanding of what causes variable shrub encroachment across the landscape. In many parts of the Arctic, shrubs are encroaching or moving into recently deglaciated regions as well as into higher elevations. But then in other parts, there's no encroachment at all or even shrub dieback. This has really significant feedbacks on an ecosystem scale because shrubs influence carbon cycling, permafrost, snow cover, as well as biotic interactions. So this kind of variable response in a heterogeneous landscape is really difficult to capture with low resolution models. And in fact, there's often even the question if models can actually predict, observe local spatial patterns in the first place. This leads me to the second part of problem two. So problem 2B, which is that we often don't know how well these models can predict local scale processes. And of course, this is tied to the problem of models not necessarily matching biological processes. And one of the reasons here is that many of these models are generally trained and validated with the same data set. This means that there are very few tests of how well models predict to new data in the same region. So very rarely do we train a model with data from one survey and then validate with data collected with a different survey, but within that same region. 
While many studies predict to hold out portions of one data set or predict a, a different space or time, rarely does anyone validate model predictions with a different data set within the same space. High resolution models might be a way to create ecologically meaningful models at a, at a meaningful spatial scale and predict to highly detailed data from new surveys. For example, <clears throat> a high resolution model might be better at capturing variations in microhabitat as conceptualized with these different white dots. You can imagine that places in the valley bottom will have a very different habit microhabitat versus places on a southern slope or even high on a ridge top. And at this scale, distribution limits might vary quite locally, and it's not really clear cut where exactly a distributional limit might be. So apart from understanding the general distribution or general potential distribution, the actual presences and absences, as well as abundance of different species might be the ecologically relevant scale here. I've been working on this over the last one and a half years with Sonia Wipf, Sina Normand, Jakob Nave Nielsen, Ida Jakobsen, Jakob Asman, and Maya Gwegwin. We first constructed two extensive plant surveys in two different fjords near Nuke in Southwest Greenland. We collected data on presence, absence, abundance, and community composition of different shrub species. And we specifically focused on the deciduous shrub species Betula nana and Salix glauca. Those two species are the most dominant and frequent species in the low Arctic and thus making them perfect for this work. Despite much research on Arctic shrub patterns, neither of these species shows clear distributional trends in Greenland relating to abiotic factors. And we don't have a clear understanding of what drives distribution versus abundance. So in Nuuk Kangalua, which is the northern fjord shown in green, we employed a stratified systematic sampling design. We sampled at five distinct sites along the length of the fjord, sampling at set elevational intervals at each of these sites. In Kangalua Sunguak, which is the southern fjord shown in orange, we used a stratified random survey. Here we used a preliminary species abundance model to stratify the landscape into low, medium, and high abundance strata, and then randomly selected grids to sample within each of these strata. So these surveys are distinct, but we collected the same data from each. And again, these places are not very far apart. We then calculated environmental predictors to 90 meters for the study area to enable us to construct high resolution SDMs and SAMs. We used the global one kilometer CHELSA data, an Arctic digital elevation model, as well as satellite images to statistically downscale temperature, precipitation, and insulation using geographically weighted regression. We use these climate variables at the traditional 30 year time scale because we found that there's no effect of short versus long term climate on shrub abundance. And we also calculated topographic as well as wetness indicators. We calculated the saga wetness indicator, which is very similar to the topographic wetness indicator, slope and aspect from the same Arctic digital elevation model. And we also derived the tassel cap wetness component from satellite images. This tassel cap wetness component it extracts the, the wetness signal from satellite images, so it's not entirely independent from vegetation structure. With these environmental parameters in hand, we then constructed SDMs and SAMs with the most important predictors for each species distribution or abundance. We use the machine learning algorithm boosted regression trees because it's non-parametric and is particularly good at generating predictions. So first, to assess predictor influence on distribution versus abundance, we constructed two sets of models with data from either Nup Kangalua, which are the green points, or from Kangalua Sungwak, which are the orange points. And then second, to then assess predictive accuracy of these models, we predicted distribution or abundance to the fjord not used in model training. 
So if we train the model with the green points, we validated it with the orange ones and vice versa. And so again, these models should be quite good at predicting to these nearby fjords. And especially because both of these data sets are from similar environmental spaces and only separated by a small body of water, we would expect these models to do quite well in predicting each other's data sets. And we definitely didn't expect a difference resulting from any sort of difference in sampling design. So here I'm just briefly showing a principal component analysis plot where the red points are the Kangalua Sunguak fjord, which is in the south, and the blue points are the Nup Kangalua fjord, which is the larger one in the north. And we can see that there's an overlap in environmental space. This plot looks slightly different for each of the models constructed because each model has a different subset of predictors, but all show this pattern of some overlap in the environmental space. So what this means is that the models train and predict within the same space. So to our first question, we found that there are indeed different variables most influential in predicting distribution versus abundance. So one thing to note about the boosted regression tree algorithm is that it does not give effect sizes or p-values. Rather, it identifies the most influential variables out of a parameter set and reports the relative variable contribution from each of these predictors. For a clarifying summary on the slide, I do not report these statistics here. So the most influential variable in predicting the distribution of Betulanana and Salix glauca is minimum temperature as well as spring precipitation. Whereas the most influential variables in predicting the species abundance were tassel cap wetness, spring precipitation, and summer insulation. So again, we had expected that distribution and abundance would be explained by different predictors. And we can see here that distribution is more broadly best predicted by very cold temperatures and precipitation, whereas abundance is best predicted by parameters broadly representing soil moisture. When we assess the predictive accuracy with the traditional split sample validation approach, where in this case we retain one third of our training data for validation, we found weak to moderate model performance. So in these plots, the green bars represent models trained with the Nuuk Kangalua data, again, that's the larger fjord to the north, and the orange bars represent models trained with the Kangalua Sunguak data, which is the smaller fjord to the south. If we focus on the left-hand plot, what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the AUC, or the area under the receiving opera op operator characteristic curve, which is a standard measure of model fit for SDMs where 0.5 would be a random model and one would be the best model. And we can see here that especially for Betulanana, the SDM it performs quite good. If we focus on the right-hand plot, what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the correlation between predicted and observed values. And we can see that these species abundance models performed quite poorly with correlation values of 0.5 or so and below. So we typically want to use these models to extrapolate. So what's very rarely done, but would be quite realistic, is to independently validate these kinds of models with independent data sets. So when we predicted onto the fjord not used in model training, we found that there is simply no predictive ability in these adjacent fjords. So again, in these plots, the green bars indicate the models trained with the Nup Kangalua data, which is the northern fjord, and the orange bars indicate the models trained with the Kangalua Sunguak data, which is a smaller fjord to the south. Again, if we focused on the left-hand plot, we have AUC on the y-axis, and we see that AUC is about 0.6 and below, so very, very poor model performance. If we focus on the right-hand plot, again, with correlation between predicted and observed values on the y-axis, we see that these correlation values are even lower than they were in the last set of plots. And again, this is a really surprising result because we had expected these models to be quite good at predicting to such a nearby fjord. What is interesting, though, 
is that the model trained with the stratified random data is better at predicting abundances compared to the stratified systematic. And we can see this difference on the right-hand plot. If we just contrast the different correlation values between the different model types. So of course, we couldn't directly test the effect of different sampling designs on our model predictions. But these results really suggest that a more randomized sampling design might better capture heterogeneous species response across the landscape. And this really highlights that the split sample validation, which is by far the most common approach, especially in SDMs, gives an over-optimistic measure of model performance compared to validation with an independent data set. Despite poor model performance, we do see an interesting pattern when exploring SDM results further, specifically those SDMs trained with the Noop Kangalua data and validated with the Kangalua Sungguak data. And that's the area shown here in these maps. These maps show probability of occurrence as predicted by the SDMs with pinker colors representing lower probability of occurrence and greener colors representing higher probability of occurrence. If we focus on the left-hand map, we can see with the black dots that the Betulanana SDM is quite good at correctly predicting absences. And this also corresponds to high specificity of the model. Whereas if we focus on the right-hand map, we can see again with these black points that the Salix Glauca SDM is particularly good at correctly predicting presences and this corresponds to high sensitivity of the model. And this is important because overall, because the SDMs have overall poor model performance, but there are still actually aspects of small scale processes that can be modeled with these. So as a solution to modeling at ecologically unmeaningful scales, I propose that we use detailed species data for high resolution models but to include the relevant predictors important at these local scales. So because our high resolution models were so low in their predictive power, it's really obvious that there are relevant predictors that we did not include. In fact, it's quite conceivable that low resolution models, on the other hand, have better predictive power because they're constructed with environmental parameters that do a pretty good job of capturing regional trends in species spatial patterns. For example, regional climate, differences between seasons and latitude do a pretty good job at describing these really large scale distributional patterns in species. However, those environmental parameters might be less important in determining local scale variation and distribution or abundance and therefore they wouldn't be as meaningful to include as predictors. We can see through a lot of different, especially experimental work that local scale patterns are more driven by microclimate, microtopography, and biotic interactions. However, there's not much work done on what drives regional versus local patterning, but this is something that we really need to understand so that we can properly parameterize models at different scales. In fact, we found that when we included biotic variables into our predictions, those predictions were improved, especially for the species abundance models. Here I'm showing the results of just including local field data on shrub species diversity, with again the correlation between predicted and observed values on the y axis. And this again, this is for the species abundance model. And the gray colors here indicate what the model performance was without including diversity in the model. And then the more solid colors indicate the, the increase in correlation once we included diversity as a predictor. And we saw similar patterns with species richness as well as competition from other shrubs. So the performance of these models is still poor. And this of course indicates that there are important variables that are not accounted for. So as a solution to not knowing whether models actually represent local biological processes, I really encourage that we start validating models with new data sets from the same region. 
but that we continue to explore the importance of sampling design. So we couldn't directly test this, but our improved results from models trained with the stratified random surveys suggest that a random sampling design might be better. However, it's rarely examined if models can predict to different data sets collected with a different design. So these differences in sampling design arise because we generally sample where we know the species will exist. Otherwise, it's just simply too much work when we're out in the field. It's actually quite critical if we can understand if our models can do this, so predict to different data sets collected with different sampling designs, because the majority of species data actually exists as these independent data sets collected with different sampling designs. And these data sets are our representation of spatial patterns across the globe. This is an avenue of research that I think is definitely worth exploring more so that we can understand what the best way is to collect species data across heterogeneous landscapes to collect training data for these kinds of predictive models. So far, I've discussed problems and solutions in modeling distribution and abundance. However, central to understanding how distribution and abundance will shift with climate change is understanding how population growth rate, or lambda, responds to conditions at and beyond current distribution limits. So while we can make all the predictions we want, which I'm showing here in the left panel with the black trees, these will only be realized if lambda is greater than or equal to one in regions of predicted rain shifts, which I'm showing with the green trees in the upper right hand panel. However, these projected rain shifts will not be realized if lambda is less than one, as indicated with the lower right hand panel. And what's particularly critical in this is understanding if species will be able to germinate and survive beyond their current distributional limits. I will be addressing this question for 25 vascular plant species in montane to subalpine regions in the Washington Cascades in the United States in an upcoming fellowship at the University of British Columbia, where I'll be working with both Amy Anger and Yannicka Hillrys Lambers. I'll be using data from their seed transplant experiment where they transplanted seeds both at and beyond current distribution limits to quantify the effects of microhabitat on seed germination and seedling survival. So the way they collected these data on population dynamics is they followed seedlings once they've, once they've sprouted over four years and in these locations also measured microclimate with hobo climate loggers. So combined with the high resolution digital elevation model for the area, we'll then be able to generate high resolution mechanistic models on distribution shifts directly based on knowledge of germination and survival in future suitable areas. So our goal is really to combine the high variation in local scale topography with demographic species response to mechanistically predict species shifts. So to close, SDMs and SAMs and their related methods are really important in both biogeographic research, as well as to understand climate change effects and to inform conservation and management. I'm particularly interested in them because I'm interested in these large scale ecological processes and how these are affected by climate change. I've been seeking to explore some of their limitations by including more biological information. And hopefully I've given you some ideas on how to improve these kinds of predictions. Of course, there are many limitations and potential solutions I did not talk about. So going forward, I encourage that we increasingly combine experimental approaches with field-based model validation. We need more experimental work to understand local population response to climate to inform composite predictions, which are better than species level predictions. We also need more work to understand the abiotic and biotic drivers of species spatial patterns so that we can parameterize models with relevant predictors. 
as much as possible, we should try to validate models with distinct data sets from different sampling designs, as well as to conduct work to explore the role of sampling design on model predictions. And finally, we should make sure that predictions are based on realistic species response. So we need to understand the dispersal versus evolutionary constraints on species range limits. So with that, I thank you all very much for your time this morning, and I would be happy to take any questions and discuss any of this in greater detail.